Hey, it's Elise Ali with this week's EQFM album Req. We're pulling out the Amy Winehouse masterpiece Back to Black. Released in 2006, the album paved the way for a neo soul revival movement. And although co producers Mark Ronson and Salam Remy helped create a sound that was steeped in the past, the music sounds contemporary, timeless even. The album tackles somber themes of heartache and regret, but the songs go down so smoothly you want to keep requeuing the record despite its heaviness. My friend and fellow WFUV DJ Binky Griptite has some insider information on the album, so I've invited him to talk with me about it today. So Binky, you actually played on this legendary record along with your bandmates in the Dap Kings. How did you get involved with this project? We had started doing some work for Mark Ronson. He was working on his solo record versions. We were somewhat in the middle of that when, you know, I heard word that Mark wanted us to do some tracks for this woman, Amy Winehouse. And when I first heard her name, I was just like, oh man, she's going to have to change that name. She's never going to make it with that name. Because <laughs> <laughs> I imagined that it was spelled like the German spelling, like W-E-I-H-A-U-S, you know? <laughs> I was just like, she's never going to make it. But anyway, yeah, so he booked like a few days with us. And yeah, he just like came in with demos, like recorded on a CD. What were the demos like? You know, just a voice and piano or something like that. I mean, the songs were all written as far as, you know, words and melody and chord changes. What we did was we just added licks and rhythm to it. So we supplemented it in those ways. And like some of the signature lines and things like that, some of the horn lines definitely were written by Dave Guy and the other horns came up with ideas. But yeah, all the basics were there. When did you finally hear the finished piece? When it came out, it sounded much bigger then when we'd recorded it, you know, you overdubbed strings and tubular bells and all kinds of other stuff. You know, it's a much bigger production. You know, the Dap Kings and Mark Ronson, we worked on six songs. Those other songs were produced by Salam Remy with a different band and everything, but they still sound good together. And some of those songs that Salam produced are some of my favorites on the record. What is your favorite song on the record? Which I know is a hard question because they're all so good. It is. And yeah, there's so many good songs, but I, I do really like Some Unholy War. The chords and the melody, I mean, it's just a really beautiful song. That's one of my favorite songs, too. There's a longing in her voice on that one that is so affecting. You really feel that when she sings. You know, near as I could tell, she just seemed to be unable to fake anything. Like, if she was happy, you knew she was happy. If she was mad, you knew she was mad. It's so wild that you actually knew her. She was such a gifted songwriter. And I love so many of her lyrics. The title track, Back to Black, just kills me. We only said goodbye with words. I died a hundred times. You go back to her and I go back to black. Oof. But you know, she's funny and sassy too. I love on Just Friends, she sings, but the guilt will kill you if she don't first. What's your favorite lyric from the album? The one I can't say on the radio. The first line in Me and Mr. Jones. What kind of effery is this? <laughs> Fun fact, I think they wanted to name the song Effery. But she only says that once and she says me and Mr. Jones a couple of times. Right, right. Me and Mr. Jones is a reference. To Nas, Nasir Jones, a very famous rapper who was also produced by Salam Remy. That was part of her interest in working with Salam Remy was that she's such a Nas fan. And it also, of course, playing off the Me and Mrs. Jones song by uh, Billy Paul from the early 70s. Yeah. There's another song on the record that is based on a song from the 60s, Ain't No Mountain High Enough. Yeah, Tears Dry on Their Own. There are Motown instrumentals that have never been released to the public floating around behind the scenes. And I would assume that she just wrote this song on top of one of those instrumentals for Ain't No Mountain High Enough because the song is exactly the same chord progression and vibe and everything. Ain't No Mountain High Enough was written by Nick Ashford and Valerie Simpson and they did get credited in Amy's version. And that was the right thing to do. She got the seal of approval from a lot of musicians for Back to Black. Ronnie Spector, who must have been an influence on Amy, actually started covering the title track and Prince covered one of her songs too, Love is a Losing Game. That's funny. Yeah, I found out about the Prince thing because a friend of mine, Morris Hayes, was Prince's keyboard player. One day he called me on the phone. He's like, yeah, yeah, man, man, P loves that song, man. We've been playing that song, uh, uh, Love's a Losing Thing. I'm just like, yeah, and that, that's not the name of the song. But um, we were on tour with Amy. We were in LA at the time and Prince was doing his residency in Vegas. And so he asked if it was possible for us to make a little side trip and just go to Vegas and open for Prince. 
and Amy wanted to do it, but it, the schedule just wouldn't allow. So that never happens. Oh, that would have been so epic. Yeah. All right, Binky, it's time now for the EQFM 6. Can you describe this album's sound or impact in six words? Tough, honest, unapologetic, and 100% Amy Winehouse. Binky Griptight talking Amy Winehouse on this week's EQFM album Requeue.